direct your attention this morning to the 50th chapter of Genesis. If we're going to give this message a title this morning, here's what it would be. From the pit <coughs> to the prison to the palace. From the pit to the prison to the palace. There is a powerful theme, a great lesson for the church, for you, for me, for anyone in regards to God's activity and divine appointments in our life. We're going to begin there with that verse 20 of the 50th chapter of the book of Genesis. And listen to what the Word of God has to say this morning. A powerful word. The Bible says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people. Alive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day of life. What a grand opportunity. Oh, my Lord, it's so good to be the church, to be with the church, to have church, and to be able to worship in spirit and truth, and to open your infallible word, not a mistake in it. And Father, we might preach from it this morning. Father, we pray that you have anointed this message and it will serve to touch the hearts of those under the sound of my voice. Father, bless us in this hour as we lift up Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A boy in school always seemed to be getting in trouble. His academic performance was poor. The teachers, the principals, most everyone else in his life told him, they told him he was no good. They said, you're bad. You're never going to amount to anything. In fact, they kicked him out of school. They said, we don't even want you here. But after he climbed the ladder of stardom and success, They asked him, who, by the way, his name was Winston Churchill, <laughs> the tenacious wartime leader, to come to speak at a commencement for that very school that they had kicked him out of. And he accepted, and he came. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there to hear that speech. <laughs> well, since you aren't, I memorized it for you. <laughs> he got up before the students, the faculty, the parents, the family, the friends. And his speech simply went like this. As he looked at that audience of people knowing his story, he said, never give up. Never give up. And then he sat down. The sum total of his speech was never give up. But I promise you, he spoke volumes that day because they knew his story. The message of the hour Christian, church, never give up. In the face of adversity, in the face of brokenness, never give up. Allow God, allow God to have his way in your life. Our text reflects the life and the times of Joseph. Jacob's son, 
Jacob's, or Joseph's story starts when he was 17 years old. His brothers were jealous of him. He was a dreamer. He would divine dreams. He was a mama's boy. And they wanted to kill him. And of course, there was this discussion, and uh, he, he contended they, they shouldn't kill him. Just Let's just throw him in a pit. And they threw him in a pit. And then eventually, they would sell him into slavery. All along, they were deceiving their daddy, Jacob. 30 years old, when he was elevated to the throne. The story spans some 22 years of time. I said Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt. You know, as we go through his story, and I'm going to just touch on a few things here that are very critical, very pivotal in his span of time, it was there that a man by the name of Potiphar was impressed with him and brought him into his life, into his home, in other words, and gave him a great opportunity. Well, in the meantime, Mrs. Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, had unholy designs upon Joseph. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs, in chapter 23, verse 27, for a harlot is a deep pit. A seductress is a narrow well. Potiphar's wife treated Joseph with disregard and disrespect, utter disrespect, by inviting him into her bed, and when her advances were rejected, she turned against him. Fornication and adultery change a pure river into a sewer. Transforms free people into slaves. And Joseph wasn't about to sacrifice his purity nor his integrity to please his master's wife. Now in Genesis, in chapter 39, in verse 9... Here was the response of Joseph. As I read this to you, listen. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. And then can I, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph was contending, I cannot do this. I will not do this. It is a sin against God. God. Potiphar's wife then lied about him, falsely accused him of a crime he had never committed and was thrown into prison, spent 13 years of his life for something he did not do. Now think about that. What would that be like to have to serve time or go to jail or go to prison for something you did not do? Simply stated, he did the right thing and he ended up in jail. It happens. Oh, listen, there's a lesson here. How many times in your life have you heard people say, it's just so unfair. I did nothing to deserve that. And of course, you're thinking in your mind, unfortunately, that's the picture of life. Life is often unfair and cruel. Things happen on a daily basis that just does not seem to be right. It's important for us to understand something. And if we don't get this, we miss it. God permitted Joseph to be treated unjustly, even put in prison, for a reason. It was going to build him up in his character and prepare him 
for the tasks that lay ahead. The prison would be a school where Joseph would learn, listen carefully, to wait on the Lord. Do you ever get impatient? I mean, you've got your mind made up how it ought to be. I mean, this is how it ought to work. I mean, I've got this figured out. And so you start praying about it, and then all of a sudden it doesn't happen. You ever do that? We get tore up sometimes, don't we? <laughs> oh my, my world's caving in. I mean, I've been there. Chances are you've been there with me. We get tore up. We don't understand. I prayed about this. I'll tell you this. When I was in high school, <coughs> I was supposed to be studying for a history test. And I still was out there playing basketball. And that happened every once in a while. And uh, so anyway, I went and took the test. And I didn't do very well. On it. I won't tell you how bad I did, but I just put it this way, I didn't do very well. <laughs> and so I went home, and of course my mother, she wanted to know how I did, and I had to be honest with her. You didn't want to lie to that woman. But I told her what happened. <coughs> Boy, she was frustrated me. I said, but mother, I prayed about it. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I know it's not exactly in the Bible, son, but God does help those who help themselves. Why didn't you study? <laughs> but you know, we get these grand ideas about things and we pray about them and maybe it doesn't turn out the way we want them. But you ever think maybe it's for a reason and God knows best and God knows more than we know? God can see further down the road than we can see. Do we ever think about it like that? Do we ever think that God has a, a bigger plan, a better plan, better results? Listen, I've learned that the hard way in life many, many, many times. Joseph had time to think. He had time to pray. He had time to ponder the meaning of those dreams that he had, that two, the particular two dreams that God had seen. He learned that God's delays were not God's denials. Now, there's a verse that I often use. I use it on a daily basis, quite frankly. It's in Romans in chapter 8 and verse 28 that says, and we know that all things work together for the good, that them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Boy, praise God, that's in the Bible. Amen. What's it saying? No matter what happens in your life, you give it to God and God can use it for something good. God can take that which was meant for evil and use it for something that is good. It, it could be anything in our life. As a Christian, those that love him, those that are called according to his purpose, have that promise. It appears with Joseph that one bad thing happened after another. Again, he was cast into a pit, then he was sold into slavery, and now he's in prison. And he didn't even do anything wrong. I don't know if this is a good illustration, but I'm going to use it anyway. Yesterday, Chris wanted to go buy flowers, and that's exactly what we did, of course. And uh, I love you, brother. I'm sorry. And uh, then, you know, we're going to plan. And of course, uh, we also had to buy some fertilizer. Now, she knows what she's doing. I know she does. And so we bought fertilizer. Now, you understand that fertilizer is manure. Now, I could have got it for free. I had to take my extra work. I had to the farm and we got a compost pile, but it made it so much handier, we just bought it in these bags. But it's manure. We know what manure is. It's waste. It's waste. And it smells... It smells. <laughs> and, and when properly used, it causes those flowers to bloom and to blossom and fill the air with a sweet fragrance. And I said, I got thinking about that when I was working on this sermon there studying last night. In a similar way, we all go through things in life that quite frankly stink. I mean, you used that terminology. You said, boy, oh, this just stinks. We hurt. Sometimes we're disappointed. Sometimes we're broken. I mean, things happen. I mean, just rains on our parade. And we say, this stinks. And, and you can very easily get discouraged. 
and think, you know, I'm, I'm just going to throw in the towel. But you don't, do you? You stay in the faith. You cling to Jesus. You get on your face before him and you pray and, and you tell him what's bothering you and, and you shed some tears, you know. And, and through it all, it makes you stronger. It prepares you for something. There's a reason for the season, you know. And so you grow. And it's all in an effort by Almighty God to take your life and help you to become all that you were created to be in His will. Stuff that stinks is not working against you, friend. Listen to me. It's not working against you. If God's in your life, it's working for you. Look at this. Here's what James says. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into our temptation, knowing this. It's a trying of your faith work of patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be complete and entire, wanting nothing. While in prison, Joseph meets this chief butler and this royal baker. And, uh, you know, he's interpreting or divining these dreams, you know. And he brought these men into Joseph's life so that he could ultimately set, set him free and give him the throne that he had been preparing him for. So you can understand what's going on. And then this Pharaoh, all of a sudden, he's having these dreams. And uh, this, this butler, he remembers Joseph divining these dreams, interpreting these dreams. He tells Pharaoh, and of course the rest is history. Joseph is elevated to second in command in Egypt in the palace. And, uh, of course, the final scene is rather interesting, isn't it? There's famine in the land, you know. And so Jacob, he says, I'm going to send, send you boys to go up there and buy food. But he doesn't send Benjamin. Remember that? He doesn't send him. And so they all go. And who in the world... You suppose they have to stand before. And they don't recognize him. They don't know. It's Joseph. And of course, one thing leads to another. And you know, uh, the way the whole thing was to play out was all of the brothers, all the brothers, all 11 of them, were supposed to come before him and bow. And so he knew that. And so finally, you know, he, he sends all of them back but one. He keeps one more or less as a hostage. And he sends him back, and eventually, eventually, they all are before him. And you know, there's a lot of beauty in this story. Uh, and that was that, that he showed them, he showed them grace and mercy. God used a famine and kidnapping and death and dream and plague and the government census to accomplish his purpose. <clears throat> Uh, when the, the boys arrived, Joseph knew that all 11 had to bow before him. So he, again, he ended up sending them back. And, and finally, Benjamin, Benjamin came with all of them. God's grace wiped out the pain and the bad memories of the past and made a new beginning. Did you hear that? That's something you got to understand. I want you to hear that again. In this story, God's grace God's favor wiped out all the pain and the bad memories of the past and made a new beginning. You see, the family would come together. There was forgiveness. There was restitution. It's a story from the pit to prison to the palace. Joseph kept growing. He kept getting stronger. His roots kept growing deeper and deeper in his faith in God. You know, when you've done the right thing, but bad things happen, you want to remember something. And that is that God has the final say. And God will lead you to your destiny. God has the final say. Someone said, you know, if life is supposed to be a bowl of cherries, then why in the world am I always in the pits? 
<laughs> Rather interesting. God. God has destined you to live a victorious life, Christian. You know, that depression is not the end. Did you hear me? It's not the end. That sickness is not the end. That broken relationship is not the end. That addiction is not the end. That life of sin is not the end. Don't let the disappointment steal your fire, steal your compassion, or your hope of eternal life. It's not the end. There is hope in Jesus Christ. Yeah. I want to show you something real quick here. You remember Bartimaeus, the blind man in the Bible? You remember, he, he heard Jesus coming down the Jericho Road. And so he, 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 he positioned himself. And as he was coming down the road, he began to cry out, Oh, son of David, have mercy upon me. You remember that? You know what happened? The crowd. Man, they got a hold of him. They're trying to hold him back. They were trying to keep him from Jesus. They were trying to quiet him. They were trying to shut him up. But he kept crying. He wasn't going to stop. He was pursuing Jesus. Did you hear me? I mean he was pursuing Jesus. Oh, son of David, have mercy upon me. And Jesus heard him. And he said, you bring him to me. And Jesus healed those blind eyes. What about the paralytic? The house was full. You remember that? I mean, there wasn't room. I mean, any more room in that house for anyone. It was crammed full of people. But this paralytic needed to see Jesus. But there was no way to get in the house. You know what they did? They cut a hole in the roof and they lowered him down in the presence of Jesus, and Jesus touched him and healed him. Oh my, think about it. There's so many stories in the Bible. It goes on and on. What about the little woman had the issue of blood? She was desperate for a touch of Jesus. Remember what she said? She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, garment, I'll be healed. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, he felt something go out of him. And he addressed her. And he told her, he said, your faith has made you whole. Oh my goodness. Do you notice something here? They were pursuing Jesus. They needed a touch. They needed to be in His presence. They needed His healing in their life. The list goes on and on and on. But the question of the hour is simply this. What is stopping us? What is getting in our way? It's all about your desire to pursue Jesus. Do people want to be saved? Do they really want to be saved? Do they really want Jesus to be the Lord of their life? Do they really want to go to, I say really want to go to heaven? What's stopping them? They need to pursue Jesus. Oh, there will always be someone trying to hold you back. There will always be something in the way. There will always be an obstacle. Satan is not going to let you to approach Jesus uncontended. My friends, he'll make a way. Whether it's through the roof or through the crowd, he'll make a way. You must pursue Jesus. You Amen. must respond. You must react to the mercy and the grace of God. Amen. You cannot sit idly by and not do anything. Jesus says, come unto me. Come. He expects you to come unto him. He did his part when he died upon an old rugged cross, shedding his blood, suffering pain like no other man has ever suffered, taking all the sins, the burden of the world upon his shoulders. He did for you what you could not do for yourself. But friend, you can pursue Jesus. You can obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you can come out of the pit. Mm -hmm. To be, you can you can you can be pardoned from prison, death row, set free by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You can reach the palace on heaven's peaceful shores. The gospel of Christ. The life of Christ epitomizes our story. Did you hear that? It epitomizes our message. What Satan meant for evil. What Satan meant for evil. Listen to me. When they took Jesus and crucified him. When he was suspended between heaven and earth. And old Satan was happy and a smile from ear to ear. Oh, we've killed Jesus. What he meant for evil, God used to redeem the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God used to give you eternal life. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says on the third day Jesus Christ arose from the grave. God gave him life. He brought him out of that grave alive. And he's alive today. Amen. What God, God turned around was Satan's attempt to destroy you. God used it for victory. What about you this morning? Maybe there's someone here that needs to obey the gospel to give their life to Christ. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe you need to come and put your faith in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess Christ. Be immersed, baptized for the mission of your sin. These ones are buried in that water grave, raised to walk in what? What's the Bible say? A newness of life. Well, I like this. It says, "Old things are passed away; behold, all things become new." Maybe, just maybe, your life is broken. There's something hurting. There's something wrong. <coughs> it could be any number of things. But you know what? <laughs> you got <another> one? <coughs> The blood of Jesus Christ is the answer. The cross is the answer. The Bible says that we are healed by His stripes. No matter what it is, you just bring it to Jesus. No matter what you have to go through, you just pursue Jesus. You just get there. He'll take care of you. I want to close with this. There's an old story that I've told over the years. And it goes like this. There was an elder lady. She had cancer. She was dying. And she knew it. There was a young preacher. And he wanted to comfort her. He wanted to say the right things. And so when he saw her, he said that which we always say, I just want you to know, and he put the arm around her, I'm praying for you. Here's what she said. She said, I really appreciate the fact that you're praying for me. You have no idea what that means to me. But I want you to do me a favor. He said, what's that? When you pray, when you pray for me, pray that I do not waste this suffering. My, my, my. No matter what you're going through, don't waste it. God can use it. God can use it. Even in the depths of your pain, and your suffering to touch someone's life and to glorify him. Let's stand. We sing our <laughs>